Hey everybody, it's time for my first lecture on Boethius' Constellation of Philosophy, um, which is a very interesting book in a number of ways. Um, one of which is it's, it's one of the really few sort of great texts of the Middle Ages. That's a kind of a part of the Western canon. Um, the Middle Ages essentially arises as the Roman Empire is falling apart. And um, along with it, there was a real um, cultural uh, downfall as well. Um, you basically had um, these um, church um, people associated with the church who were literate and sort of became the keepers of philosophy, even secular philosophy. Um, the few people who are really literate, um, they did a lot of translations of texts, Boethius did translations as well. Um, and um, you see a, a number of different people vying for power in what used to be the Roman Empire and the different parts of the Roman Empire. Um, invaders coming from outside of, of the Roman Empire um, as it was kind of falling apart. So uh, culture was a real at a real nadir at this time, it was at a real low. Um, so the fact that the constellation of philosophy was sort of written at this time and pulls from so many different sources and in particular, um, obviously the Bible, um, Boethius was obviously a Christian, but in addition to that, bringing to bear um, culture, philosophy, ideas from um, the great Roman writers and thinkers and also the great Greek writers and thinkers and kind of bringing all those things together um, at a time, as I said, that um, um, it was pretty amazing. Um, as we sort of move through the Middle Ages, um, but then we move into the era that's known as the Renaissance, right, the rebirth after the um, after the Middle Ages. So, um, and we'll start to see the beginnings of that as we get into our later readings. So I want to talk a little bit about Boethius in terms of his background. Um, the, uh, there are different translations for this reading. Um, I tried to provide you with what I thought was a pretty good translation and what I made available for you in the file folder for Boethius. Um, and this is a little tricky sort of cutting and pasting from documents. Um, the part that's in quotation marks is actually appears as poetry in the text and the rest is the, the prose or the kind of narrative part of the text. Um, a good portion of which sort of appears as a kind of platonic dialogue between Boethius and, and Lady Philosophy as she is sort of designated and I'll get into that in a little more detail. Um, and, and the poetry is sort of, of reflecting a little bit on um, what's going on um, in the um, in the dialogue between Boethius and Lady Philosophy, and sort of gives us a sense of of um, how Boethius is dealing emotionally with a very difficult situation. Um, Boethius was a consul in the Roman Empire during its latter part. Um, the consul was actually the highest elected political official. Um, in Rome, highest political, uh, elected political office. Um, he was born um, near Rome in 480 and died in 524. So as you can see there, he didn't live terribly long, um, about 44 years, um, and died uh, also in Italy in a place called Pavia that was what was a part of kind of the Gothic empire at the time. Um, that uh, overlapped with the Roman Empire, as I said, as it was, as it was in its downturn. Um, he came from a, a Christian family, been Christian for about a hundred years. Um, he became an orphan when he was about seven years old, um, and um, his father actually uh, became a consul and died shortly afterwards. He would later have two sons who would also be consuls. Um, he was extremely well-educated and he had to have been to have written a text like this. 
Um, there are questions about whether or not, since he wrote this from prison, he actually had any of his books with him. Um, in my edition of the book, the person who writes the introduction kind of suggests that maybe he didn't and points out that people's memory was a lot stronger back at that time because there wasn't, you know, books weren't as, as um, easy to find. Um, and people had to, had to really remember things better if it was gonna you know, stay with them. Um, but it's pretty amazing, both in terms of the intellectual resources he brings to bear in the discussion and, and also um, the fact that he seems to remember in pretty significant detail um, these different writers that he's talking about. So definitely he was well-educated, fluent in Greek as well as, as, as in Latin, of course. Um, and um, he, there's no firm evidence that he studied in Athens or in Alexandria, but many historians believe he must have had some kind of formal education at, at um, you know, one of those places, one of those cities um, to have been as erudite as he was. As I mentioned, he had two uh, sons who also became consuls actually on the same day, which was uh, kind of the high point of his life. Shortly after was to become the low point of his life. As we know, he becomes imprisoned. Um, he wrote some really important text. He actually wrote a text on mathematics that was used for uh, many centuries, not because it was really a fantastic text, but because, uh, again, there was a really low point in the development of culture and intellect at the time, um, so that his text on called arithmetic actually stayed around for a while. Um, he um, came up with or devised, um, or at least formalized, what became known as the quadrivium. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things here at this point. One is just a picture of um, Boethius um, next to a copy of the Constellation of Philosophy. Can you so you can kind of get a sense what he looks like? Um, definitely fits in with pictures of of uh, people from Rome at the time, as we might imagine them. Um, and then I also have. Um, some vocabulary that I'll be uh, putting on the screen um, now and again that are some, some terms I think are important and useful to remember. One of them being um, quadrivium, which I just mentioned, it's at the bottom here. And the quadrivium was sort of a course of education involving arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music theory. And quadrivium, the first part of that quad obviously you know, means four. It was a course of education that was introduced in monasteries. Um, and if you think about um, the different aspects of the quadrivium in these four things, they have some things in common, right? They're all kind of systematic. Um, they all are very mathematical. Um, those of you who know music theory know it's very mathematical. Um, it's one reason that people who are good at musicians are often really good at mathematics. Um, it's constant. It's not something that changes sort of over time like history does, for example. And it has a very logical kind of structure to it. So it became a part of, of this um, a sequence of education um, that um, was you know, to become very significant. And again, something that was very common in monasteries. And so Boethius helped to, um, helped to devise that. Um, see a few other things here. Um, he had his sort of his, his life work, something that I, th I think is also really interesting. Um, and there are actually two sides of two aspects of this. The first thing is he was really trying to combine, and you can see this in Constellation of Philosophy, faith and uh, you know, beliefs um, that one would acquire through faith, faith as a guide into one's life, how to live one's life. And this was obviously Christian faith for Boethius to try to combine that with reason and sort of the intellectual life of Greek um, and Rome, Greece and Rome. Um, so sort of interesting there, trying to bring the, all those different traditions together, right? I mean, there are enough significant differences between uh, sort of Greek and Roman culture, philosophy, although there's certainly a great deal of overlap as well, but many differences between them. And then to bring in um, Christianity and, and, um, and, you know, beliefs acquired through faith um, and having that as something that, um, again, is a guide to your life in the way you think about 
yourself, the world around you, the kind of things you want to accomplish in your life, views of human nature, all those kind of things. So trying to bring together some things there that were very, very different. Uh, a real challenge to bring those traditions together because some people might argue that they're really incompatible. That it, that certainly uh, faith in Christianity on the one hand and reason as identified with Greek and Roman kind of philosophy on the other hand as, as seeming to be very inconsistent. But in addition to that, kind of within that, he claimed to be able to, that it was possible to reconcile completely Plato and Aristotle and their philosophies. And um, as you might recall from the beginning of the semester, when I did my lectures on Plato and Aristotle, I really emphasized how in, in so many ways they were different, right? Plato, the, the idealist thinker, um, Aristotle being the realist. Um, there are different ways of going about doing philosophy and thinking about you know, having read Plato's dialogues versus, versus Aristotle's writings um, and his ethics that we read. Aristotle himself, even in the ethics, recognizing and referring to particularly to Plato as somebody who's some of whose ideas they, he was going to kind of reject uh, respectfully. Um, and um, I think I also mentioned as well that many people have argued that everybody's either ultimately a Platonist or an Aristotelian because those are the two major kinds of philosophy, at least one ways of thinking about uh, uh, the first major kind of cut in what's overall called philosophy, or at least Western philosophy, between idealism on one side and realism on the other hand. But Boethius really believed it was, it was possible to reconcile um, Aristotle and Plato. So, um, you know, reconciling Aristotle and Plato, combining them with Greek philosophy and, and the, the Greek sort of rationalist tradition, um, and then being able to, to make that compatible with Christianity. And, um, and beliefs and, and views on things um, grounded in faith. Um, that's an awful lot to take on, which is one reason that I said he didn't actually you know, complete this, um, this attempt in his, in his lifetime. Um, just briefly again, I'm gonna look back at um, the terminology I had up a minute ago, if it's possible to do that. and talk about some of the other things um, that are on here. Uh, I've mentioned Middle Ages. You'll see a couple different spellings for Middle Ages. Um, that's what when we the, you hear the word medieval. Um, Middle Ages is actually what the, uh, that's referring to in terms of the formal definition. People often use medieval kind of metaphorically talking about somebody you know being medieval or we think about medieval thinking about um, um, certain kinds of, of um, torturous kind of punishment um, and um, a sort of a lack of compassion, et cetera. Um, you can see how that's kind of related to kind of the Middle Ages if we think of this as you know the downfall of the Roman Empire and all the chaos that ensued um, and all the different people who were vying for power and control of, of different portions of what was once the Roman Empire. Um, and then I also want to talk about, about the word eclecticism here. Um, Boethius was definitely an eclectic. Sometimes you'll see the word eclectic and eclecticism used in a pejorative sense, uh, referring to somebody who's trying to bring together a bunch of, of things that are incompatible. Um, you often see eclecticism in the arts, for example, right? If somebody's trying to bring together two very different traditions and, and music, um, or in the visual arts, um, um, if, if, if they are trying to bring those you know, things together and seem to be very unsuccessful, sometimes people will refer to eclectic in a kind of pejorative or negative way. It also has a, a positive uh, of, of spin that can be put on it as well. When people are successful in bringing together diverse kinds of, of influences um, and ways of doing things and ways of thinking about things, um, and to show where there's compatibility, maybe where people once believed that things were incompatible. Um, this you also see in the arts. Um, artistic, um, as people saw, kind of moved away from very formalist artistic traditions and started bringing pieces of different traditions together, you can think you can talk about eclectic art, um, visual art that combines maybe um, painting, 
with um, um, kind of found objects of one kind or another. Uh, there was definitely a, 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 a tradition that developed in this country in the 20th century, middle 20th century, um, of artists who used found objects and sometimes combined them with more traditional kinds of, of, of art. Um, you can see it in music and bringing together Baroque music maybe with uh, more classical music um, or uh, much more modern contemporary classical music with bits of, of classical or Baroque music. Um, and bringing those, bringing those things together uh, to create something new, right? Um, it's hard to do, to be successful, to bring the things together in a way that's convincing if they're coming from very different traditions. Um, one example, uh, another example is you often see is in architecture. And um, eclecticism is often identified with postmodernism, where modernism is identified with the idea that there are right ways to do things and, and formal traditions that one needs to follow. Again, in the arts, you see this very powerfully. Um, and within postmodernism, you get beyond this idea that there's one white ray to, to, to do a painting or to write a novel or what, what poetry has to consist in or architecture and architectural traditions um, to this idea of kind of getting away from that and seeing about, you know, looking at the value of saying, um, you know, we, live, we were limited, have been limiting ourselves by believing that we had to follow these forms and these particular traditions. Um, especially when we start to get away from the idea that there's one best and right tradition, right? And so there's a definitely kind of a, a multicultural, you might say, aspect to postmodernism as well. Um, but one of the ways you see it in, in postmodernism is in postmodern architecture. Um, in Chicago, where I did my graduate work, there's a, a library called the Harold Washington Library. Harold Washington was, I believe, the first black mayor of Chicago. And it's a very eclectic piece of architecture. Um, it's got these huge columns that look very much like what you'd see in Roman or Greek architecture. It's got a lot of glass, like you'd see in more contemporary architecture. And it's also got these huge gargoyles hanging off the sides of the building, like you'd see in Gothic architecture. Um, and it's just a really fascinating building and a great example of, you know, eclecticism. Um, so it's, eclecticism is kind of a complicated term. Again, sometimes it's used negatively or pejoratively, sometimes not, um, but it typically has to do with bringing together very diverse things that again, at least on the surface might seem to be incompatible or at least things from very different traditions uh, such that you are breaking with following a specific form or format as, you know, when it comes to writing music or, or the visual arts again, or, or dance or architecture, et cetera. So I just wanted to, to share that with you because uh, certainly in all the different things Boethius is trying to bring together, Greek and Roman philosophy, along with Christianity, et cetera, definitely would identify him as an eclectic. Um, so that's an important, um, important idea here. Um, see a couple other th things. Um, one of the reasons are many historians believe that we still have some of, in particular, Aristotle's writings with us are the fact that Boethius um, did these translations, in Latin translations, um, as fewer and fewer people, certainly in, in his part of the world, uh, knew Greek, were able to read things in Greek, etc., to make those Latin translations available to people um, help to keep alive um, and, and pass, make, allow to pass through, through time those writings. Um, his categories in, in, in particular and some of his other, uh, Aristotle's other writings. Um, so that's, he's very important if nothing else in, in, and because we might not have some of these texts had not been for Boethius. Um, there are a couple of famous quotes from an English philosopher named Bertrand Russell, a 20th century philosopher to try and pointing out the greatness of Boethius. He says, he would have been remarkable in any age in the age in which he lived, you know, the middle ages, he's utterly amazing. Again, it's being so erudite, so knowledgeable, so well read um, and having the ability really in relative isolation to bring together, you know, all these great traditions and to be so knowledgeable. Um, when he was consul, um, he uh, basically worked for a guy named Theodoric. Theodoric was a Goth. The Goths were Germanic tribes. 
um, sort of coming from um, the east, the northeast. Um, and um, Theodoric was um, kind of the self-proclaimed king of Italy for a time. Um, I will try to share with you. Here's actually a, um, this is actually from um, a book on, on Theodoric. King of the Ostrogoths, regent of the Visigoths and viceroy of the Eastern Roman Empire in the fourth century AD. I think I mentioned in my last lecture that um, the Roman Empire at one point broke into several different pieces. Um, it's most, most famously in four different pieces. And of course, each of the people who were um, in charge, in power in those, in those different regions um, had dreams of taking over the other regions as well. Um, there's a famous um, um, piece of art that, that shows the kind of the, the four people as together being together as representing the Roman Empire. Um, but they sort of all look like they're kind of at the ready to stab uh, the other people in the back um, and, and their desire to expand their, their realms, uh, their sections of, of the Roman Empire at the same time. Um, and um, I'll also share with you briefly, because I, I think it's actually in the Perry PowerPoint for this section of reading is the mausoleum of Theodoric. So you can see what that looks like. That still does survive to this day um, in relatively decent shape. I'm not sure how much of this actually had to be rebuilt, but that's the mausoleum of, of Theodoric. Um, I'm gonna go in a little more detail sort of about Theodoric and, and this part of the Roman empire because it's important to understand um, the kind of things that, that really had this huge impact on, on Boethius' life. Um, so Theodoric was uh, employed Boethius to reform the coinage, um, to kind of show off to other people, other maybe less sophisticated barbarian kings as they're called. Barbarian just means they come from, from different tribes, um, not from what we would th typically think of as nations or countries. Um, with devices such as sundials and water clocks, you know, et cetera. Uh, this is something that really becomes common too as we move into the, the feudal era as we know it. Um, and um, with the great monarchies, they would often um, have people who they would adopt into their, as, as a part of their court, who were philosophers or mathematicians or scientists, just to kind of show off and maybe to help educate them as well. Um, and um, so that they could, it was a sense of, you know, give them a sense of superiority that they felt they needed to have. Theodoric ruled Italy as essentially an independent monarch, although he was the nominal representative of the Byzantine Empire, which comes from the East, often identified with the area today known as Turkey. Uh, he had himself proclaimed king at Ravenna in Italy in 494. After taking back Italy uh, from Odysseus, Boethius became magister officiorium under Theodoric in about 1520. Um, it was about this time that Boethius worked to mend relations between the church in Rome and the church in Constantinople. So between the, the, the Roman um, Christian church and um, the church in Constantinople, um, that was difficult. You know, I mean, to, to kind of, to be a go-between and to even put yourself between um, these, these churches um, who um, were um, sort of embracing the faith in different kinds of ways and who had different political ambitions at the same time. And it was kind of dangerous to put yourself in that kind of position as he did. Um, Theodoric was also known as what's called an Arian and um, I'll pop up again, this um, vocabulary here. If I can find it. Um, Arian. Arian was a, a Christian heresy. Um, people that taught the divinity of the father, but not of the son often referred to as Arian. That's A-R-I-A-N. Arian as in 
Nazism, people who brought in, bought into this mythology of the superiority of certain peoples, people with a certain origin, that's often spelled A-R-Y-A-N. So make sure when you hear people use the term Aryan that you know what they're referring to. The Christian heretical sect uh, that Theodoric was a part of, that taught divinity of the father, but not of the son. And you can see where that's going to get um, Theodoric in trouble with um, Orthodox Christian church, right? Which obviously embraced the divinity of, of, of the son of, of Jesus as the Christ. Um, and um, I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, these groups that um, establish themselves in, um, in Europe and what had once been the uh, Roman Empire as we know of it in its kind of healthier state before it started falling apart. And um, so we have these tribes, the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths, and I'm just gonna show you briefly here um, how they kind of fit into the, the picture. Um, and I sort of have two different maps that I'll show you here briefly. <clears throat> so in the first one, you can see that the Visigoth kingdom was farther here to the west. The Ostrogoth kingdom was farther to the east. Um, this is the area of Theodoric. I mentioned him proclaiming himself uh, ruler in Ravenna. There's Ravenna, Italy. There's where Rome is. Um, and these groups again came from um, farther to from the east. Um, this is the fifth and sixth century. So this is um, the area, the, the time of, of essentially of uh, Theodoric and Boethius. Um, and then we have the Visigoths who are um, on the, this is the area of, of, um, of Spain and Portugal, et cetera, farther to the west. Um, and I have one other sort of map, um, invasion of the Roman Empire from 100 to 500. Um, so again, um, the latter part of that is, is the area we're kind of talking about here. So here you have the Eastern Roman Empire. I mentioned Constantinople and the church in Constantinople, the Western Roman Empire um, um, headed up in Rome. So again, the conflicts between the Roman church and the church in Constantinople that I talked about. So you can see the different groups that, that wanted again to stake their claim and in the Roman Empire as it was you know, falling apart, uh, which was probably inevitable in such a, a huge empire. Um, and to try to control that politically and militarily, that, that you know, um, huge piece of geography, um, you know, nearly impossible, if not ultimately in the end impossible. Um, so you have a group called the Vandals. That's where we get that word from vandalism, right? Who were in invading. Um, you can see their, their kind of takeoff place uh, to Rome was from Carthage, right? Dido's Carthage. So we have Sicily, um, you have Sicily and then the boot here of, of Italy, Carthage here. Um, Huns, we, we know about the Huns and the invasions of the Huns. Um, Attila the Hun, for example, right? Well-known. Um, the Frank peoples, um, as we move up here through uh, what we know as of, of Belgium and Scandinavian countries, um, Anglo-Saxons, um, this area of France actually being sort of known as, as Saxony. Um, and then we have the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. And again, the Visigoths ending up farther west here in the Western part of the Roman empire. Um, so we have, we have the kind of the split off here. We have the Goths kind of coming down. Um, Ostrogoths in the Eastern part here, um, at least if we're, if we're looking at this, this, if you're looking at the Western part of the Roman empire, you end up with the Ostrogoths in, in, in um, the Roman part along with the Eastern Roman empire. And then you have the Visigoths just in the Western part of the Western Roman empire. Um, and so you can kind of imagine the, the chaos that ensues over these you know, 500 years or so with these different groups, um, the different invasions, the different leaders, the different kings, um, the different belief systems that they brought, the different culture that they brought. Um, it, you, can, you can sort of understand why it took as long as it did historically for 
the map of Europe as we come to know it eventually um, begins to come into shape with the development of, of, the, of the feudal monarchies that, that we all identify with you know, England and France and Italy uh, and Spain, et cetera. And then eventually into the map of, of Europe as we know of it today, um, which really doesn't come finally into shape until um, after World War I and World War II. Um, so again, I just wanted to share those things with you briefly. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, Boethius is identified with um, what's called Christian humanism. And that Christian humanism is kind of reflected in, as I mentioned, the kind of bringing together of the faith tradition of Christianity with the philosophy of Greek and Rome. Um, humanism typically um, emphasizes the ability of human beings to thrive, to achieve maybe a kind of perfection um, through culture, through language, through education, and emphasizes um, the, the, um, the capacities that human beings have um, to create you know, great cultures and great art and all the kind of things we associate with it. Um, Christian humanism kind of emerges um, again, out of as we move into the kind of the New Testament era here, um, with um, the possibility of a more positive view of human nature, uh, you you tend to see a more positive human view in human nature in the New Testament, for example, than the Old Testament. So this is why this is often called Christian humanism, and it's bringing together Christian ideas with these humanist you know ideas that pre-existed from again traditions like Greek and Rome, um, and. Uh, the, the difference between it and the earlier um, kinds of, of humanism um, are that the, the, the humanism of Greek and Rome was thought to be kind of inconsistent with the view of human nature that we have in the Old Testament. Um, because obviously Greek and Roman tradition emphasizes the great achievements and, of, and cultural achievements and political achievements that human beings are capable of making in places like Greek and Rome. Um, and it seems to, and it and conflicts with a real negative view of human nature. Christianity and the Christian humanism is sort of like, you know, um, if, if God made uh, um, human beings in his image, um, and then we have Christ coming to, to save human beings from their sins, um, there's a little more of this sort of, of, of idea of, um, let's look at the positive side of human nature. You know, God gave human beings the ability to create art and philosophy and science um, as it develops and to be to use reason to be rational right so it brings a more positive view of human nature and that more positive view of human nature um, even though again things like original sin still exist that more positive view of human nature uh, seems to be more compatible ultimately with the humanism of greek and rome and so you can see why how boethius is embracing both of those things that will differ from what's later called secular humanism, which starts to emerge with the Enlightenment and Enlightenment philosophy um, in the um, 17th century. Um, and the people that we think of who are influential in political philosophy in this country, Voltaire, Locke, Rousseau, and those people who helped to develop um, what we think of today as, as sort of modern science. Um, that kind of humanism uh, started to embrace reason and intellect and science as um, increasingly um, in competition with faith and with different kinds of Christian traditions. Um, and it's a gradual thing and it's piecemeal. And as always, I'm making a grand generalizations because I'm talking about huge, very complex systems of ideas and as they change over time, but nonetheless, that secular humanism um, is, is what is more identifiable with, for example, um, those political philosophers who I mentioned earlier who influenced the founders in this country, right? Um, there are references to God, for example, in the Declaration of Independence, but it's more, it's, it's less the Christian God and it's more deism, uh, a belief in, in, in a superior being, but not wanting to embrace speci a specific um, um, set of religious beliefs, 
a, a specific religious denomination, uh, et cetera. Um, you see that maybe most famously in Thomas Jefferson, who actually created his own Bible by cutting out portions of the Bible he dis kind of disagreed with and keeping the portions he, the portions he agreed with. Um, and so that the references to God, even the Declaration of Independence, are, are arguably more references to, to a kind of a deist view of, of, of God than uh, the Christian view. Um, then you look at the Constitution, and there, there are no references to God at all, right? So um, it doesn't mean these people were not religious or irreligious, um, but they tended to be more, more deists, not embracing in particular different Christian denominations. Um, and as you can see, that, that is consistent with the separation of church and state that exists at least formally in this country, right? Um, and it's a very important part of, of um, our kind of political philosophy and the relationship between church and state in this country, which is a very obviously complicated one because of that. Um, so that's the difference between the Christian humanism of kind of Boethius and the, the secular humanism that would sort of emerge later on. Um, that's something that's discussed in, in great detail as we as as one gets into the texts that are used in, in Hum too. Um, so what happens to Boethius? How does he end up in prison? Um, what essentially happens is a guy named Albinus is a critic of Theodoric. And he's been writing letters to people, including to Constantinople, critical of Theodoric supposedly. Um, uh, Boethius actually comes to his defense. And in coming his defense, he actually puts himself in between Theodoric and Albinus. Now, we don't know whether these claims that Albinus was writing these letters are just claims that his enemies were making, um, et cetera, in, in terms of the, um, the, the Senate. Um, but Boethius tries to come in his, to his defense and um, therefore ends up um, creating enemies in the Senate um, who claim that, that Boethius is, is in on this kind of um, attempted overthrow of Theodoric uh, of, of writing these critical letters along with Albinus. And so Theodoric has really no choice, but um, after the, the Senate condemns Boethius to sentence him to death. Now, unfortunately, along with that, some, um, Boethius' father-in-law, whose name was Symmachus, also ends up ultimately being put to death for this because he comes to Boethius' aid. Um, Boethius was was not you know born uh, you know super wealthy, but he did um, become um, a part of the family of this guy named Symmachus, who did have some power and wealth, um, and was a great supporter of Boethius. And uh, so Symmachus is partly responsible, we believe, for um, helping to get Boethius foot in the door when it comes to becoming a, a political figure, becoming a leader um, in Italy. And, um, and Symmachus likes Boethius so much that he allows um, his daughter Rusticana to marry Boethius. And so he becomes part of that family. So things are looking great. Uh, Symmachus ultimately does come to the defense of Boethius. Um, when all of the, this um, pol political stuff kind of comes to a head and unfortunately ends up going down along with Albinus and Boethius and, and um, kind of losing his life from it, unfortunately. Um, so this is how Boethius ends up in prison. And it was from prison that he writes the Constellation of Philosophy. Um, philosophy being something that can console him in his hour of need. And um, as, as in the, you know, we read the first two, two parts of the consolation that you had as assigned for Monday. Um, he's in prison. He's lamenting his situation. Uh, you know, how did I end up here? What did I do wrong? Um, I tried to be an upstanding person. I tried to do the right thing. I wasn't necessarily out to achieve power and wealth. It kind of came to me just naturally through my achievements. Um, and now here I am all of a sudden um, awaiting my death. And again, I don't know if he necessarily knew what his death would be like, but it was one of these, again, torturous deaths where torture, you were tortured essentially before you were put to death. 
and um, and so he's you know he's he's thinking about his fate, and um, a figure comes to him identified as Lady Philosophy, and Lady Philosophy does appear in other um, in places other than in Boethius, um, and uh, comes to console him. And Lady Philosophy essentially was. Um, his constant companion during his youth, because he studied philosophy, obviously, in particular Greek and Roman philosophy, and 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 maybe maybe especially Plato and Aristotle, whose you see evidence of all through the Constellation, and I'll point out a couple of those places. And um, philosophy essentially is serves as a kind of medicine to ease him in his sorrows, to console him in his in the situation that he's in here. Um, and philosophy kind of represents constancy and reason as, as medicine for him being kind of emotionally distraught. So again, we, we see this dichotomy between emotion on the one hand um, and, and being a negative thing and, 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 and pulling you away from reason and philosophy on the other hand, and eventually science is identified with reason and constancy and and self-control and logic and all those kinds of things. So you see again, this sort of dichotomy. Um, and you see it very specifically in some of the things that, um, that, that Lady Philosophy talks to Boethius about. Um, so there are lots of different images of what, you know, what Lady Philosophy might have looked like or what this kind of scene might have looked like. Um, here's you know, one example um, of Boethius um, being consoled by Lady Philosophy, and you can see in the white there, and looking, and 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 being portrayed as as as, as in a way, and um, not necessarily a supernatural figure, um, but somebody who is um, representing um, these very important ideas and beliefs that we think of as as philosophy. And that again, did, did play in some ways intellectually as big a role in Boethius' life as his Christianity did. Um, I think I have one other picture um, of what such a scene might have looked like here. Um, and again, we see Lady uh, Philosophy and Boethius down on his knees here. Um, so Lady, Lady Philosophy comes to him and, and he, you know, they're in kind of interesting description of what she looks like, um, kind of larger than life, um, there to console him. And one of the first things that we see here is, is Lady Philosophy telling Boethius, you know, why did you let yourself to become overwrought by emotion? Uh, um, how did you, you know, you, you allowed yourself to forget the constancy and the reason as something that can sustain you and something that represents logic and, and reason and rationality in philosophy and let yourself over become, you know, become overwrought by the, the muses of poetry as, as it's sort of put, um, who, um, and, and there's a, um, an interesting passage, and again, translations are different, but essentially, this is early in book one. Um, the, the, she sees the muses of poetry at the bedside of Boethius um, and, and making him, again, more overwrought emotionally in his situation. Uh, who she demanded, her, her piercing eyes alight with fire, has allowed these hysterical sluts to approach the sick man's bedside they have no medicine to ease his pains, only sweetened poisons to make them worse. These are the very creatures who slay the rich and fruitful harvest of reason with the barren thorns of passion. They habituate men to their sickness of mind instead of curing them, right? And um, so the, poses, the muses of poetry obviously viewed very negatively here as, as taking Boethius in the wrong direction um, in, in the situation that he's in, he needs to, this is a time more than ever that he needs philosophy to console him, to be his, his medicine and to, again, um, help him kind of maintain himself, you know, mentally as he prepares for his death. Um, there's also a great contrast made here between philosophy 
and um, on the one hand, lady philosophy and lady fortune as, as representing something very different. Um, the idea of the wheel of fortune, and I'm not talking about the game show, but just the idea of um, kind of a mythological idea of fortune um, as um, having a wheel, fortune's wheel um, that spins, right? And you never know where things are gonna end up. Uh, that fortune um, does not represent consistency and reason, right? It, it re represents chance um, and it's fickle. Um, and Lady Fortune is, is fickle, right? As, as opposed to being constant and consistent as philosophy is. Um, there's, what I put up on the screen here, there's a, a famous a piece of music by Carl Orff called Carmina Burana that some of you might be familiar with, who are familiar with um, um, uh, vocal music. Um, all of you probably have heard parts of Carmina Burana before, the very beginning part of for, um, singing about fortune. Uh, has been used in car commercials and movies and lots of other things. Um, and it's, it's sort of based on this, um, Orff was a, was a monk. Um, and th this again is a, an important sort of oratorio, early oratorio um, that deals with Lady Fortune. Um, there's some other um, representations of um, Fortune as well. I don't think I have another in here for you at the moment. Um, so um, ba essentially, Lady Philosophy says, you know, why did you, why do you um, look to fortune so much? You know, why do you allow yourself to think that your life is controlled by fortune? Um, bad fortune, bad luck are inevitable, right? Um, you've had lots of good luck in your life, right? You, you married into Symmachus's family, you became a consul, your two, your two sons became consuls. Um, everything's sort of gone your way and it's now just your time for things to go the other way. And it, it's inevitable, right? That things will turn against you, right? Um, because things ultimately have to balance out, you know, good fortune and bad fortune. Um, and um, so even though the idea of fortune or Lady Fortune or Fortuna comes from mythology, it was still very popular in Christianity. And again, you can see again, Boethius appealing to it and writing about uh, fortune. Um, there's a document on, on fortune that I put in um, Canvas um, that, that talks about it. Um, and you can see it in particularly in relation to the constellation of philosophy. It says here by statesman and philosopher uh, Boethius, uh, written while faced execution reflected the Christian theology of, of Cassus that the apparently random and often ruinous turns of fortune's wheel are in fact both inevitable and providential, that even the most coincidental events are part of God's hidden plan, which one should not resist or try to change, um, even seeing fortune as a kind of a servant of God, right, that, um, that you should have known all along that while you're having good fortune, that bad fortune was going to appear at some point or another, right? Um, now, Boethius could say, okay, yeah, bad fortune. Maybe I, maybe I had some coming to me, but being put to death at age 44 and being tortured and whatever, um, that's a pretty heavy downside, um, you know, something to kind of even, this, even the scales here. And then there's also the idea of the wheel of fortune uh, mythologically, again, of Lady Fortune spinning this wheel, you never know where it's gonna end up. The you know, ubiquitous image, in other words, it's, it's, you see it in lots of places, of the wheel of fortune found throughout the Middle Ages, um, a direct legacy of the second book of Boethius' Consolation. Lady Fortune is represented as larger than life to underscore her importance, just as Lady Philosophy is represented as, as larger than life. Um, medieval representations of fortune emphasize her duality and instability, right? Good luck and bad luck. And Lady Fortune is fickle. You don't know when the good luck is going to come. You don't know when the bad luck is going to come. And is as two-faced. We often talk about people being two-faced who are um, say one thing at one time and another thing at another time, right? Like maybe many of our politicians do. Um, and like the two sides of the face of Janus, and that comes from mythology, J-A-N-U-S, Janus, sometimes instead of two-faced, you'll hear somebody who may be relatively 
um, literate saying Jan is faced instead of two faced, but it means the same kind of thing. So Lady Fortune is represented as Janice face, one half of her face black, one half of the face white. She may be blindfolded, but without, without the scales, she's blind to, to justice. Um, so um, we again see some of these uh, mythological traditions and even pagan traditions still alive in Boethius, not surprisingly, because he's still drawing on um, ancient Greek and ancient Roman philosophy. You know, we're talking, um, you know, 500, um, 400, 500 AD, you know, et cetera. So uh, there are elements of, of pagan philosophy and thinking and of, of um, Greek and Roman and Roman philosophy are still very powerful and Greek and Roman mythology are still, you know, influential to agree in people's lives. Um, um, one other thing I want to talk about, and then I'll talk specifically about the influences of Plato and Aristotle. Um, there's something that is um, often referred to as the ancient quarrel, so um, or debate or conflict that is ancient. And Plato claimed that it was actually pre-existed his day. Um, it definitely you can see it in Plato's writings. And this is a quarrel kind of between, on the one hand, reason. Um, and philosophy versus um, the arts and maybe more specifically poetry on the other hand. And the idea is kind of which of those should one look to as guide to as a guide to one's life, right? Which is which is a better path to the good life, and is a better define you know provides a better definition of what the good life looks like and what it involves. Um, should one look more towards philosophy and to reason? As, as a guide to one's life, or should one look more to the arts and poetry? And it's often called a quarrel because people have argued that those two things can lead you in different directions, right? That the, the path of reason might lead you in one direction, the path of art and poetry, often identified with emotion, again, affect, imagination, intuition, might lead you down a very different path. So which path should you kind of follow? You know, we have Plato in his Republic, his imaginary ideal state, saying that he was going to throw out the poets unless they could show him and convince him they actually um, could be good for people, especially young people who are even more likely to be pulled around by their emotions than adults are, uh, because young people haven't developed, again, that re rational capacity yet to so the reason could control their emotions. Um, and, and even today, again, I think we still believe that, that young people um, need to have, um, we need to hold, withhold certain things from them, right? We have warning labels on music and in films and other kinds of things, right? Books are banned in some schools because we don't think young people are really mature enough to really deal with the themes that they might involve. Um, and so, you know, that's a theme that goes all the way back to Plato's day. Um, so again, we see the ancient quarrel at work here in, in um, the constellation of philosophy um, as identified as things that might be pulling him in different directions, right? The muses of poetry may be pulling him in one direction, lady philosophy representing reason and um, you know, pulling him in another direction. Philosophy, uh, excuse me, science would also eventually um, come to represent the reason side, the philosophy side of the ancient quarrel. So eventually the ancient quarrel is it becomes identified more sometimes with science and art, right? Um, as, as the two things that can be deeply influential on one's life and one's belief and the decisions that, you know, that one makes about how to live life. Um, and um, again, which does, does one look more towards, especially in places where they seem to conflict? Um, so again, we might, might even today still see that ancient quarrel at work in some ways. So let me lastly talk a little bit about some of the themes that we see in the, the first two books here. Um, and you definitely see very direct influence of Plato. Um, Boethius readers would have recognized, um, that, you know, the influence of Plato here. Um, and there are just a couple of things in particular I just want to mention briefly. 
um, in section three of book one, right after the, uh, the section of poetry that appears right before it. And again, you'll see a little bit of a different take on Boethius' mental state in the poetry portions of the Constellation than you'll see in the prose portions, which again, in some ways often seem to, at least to some degree, mimic a platonic dialogue. And Boethius says, in the same way the clouds of my grief dissolved and I drank in the light, my thoughts recollected, I turned to examine the face of my physician, Lady Philosophy. I turned my eyes and fixed my gaze upon her and I saw that it was my nurse in whose house I had been cared for since my youth, philosophy, right? So he read a lot of philosophy. It was, it was his guide um, um, in his life as a young person. I asked her why she had come down from the heights of heaven to my lonely place of banishment. Um, and she says, why my child, she replied, should I desert you? Why should I not share your labor and the burden you have been saddled with um, etc. And it kind of goes on from there. Um, so that idea of darkness and light of, um, again, it's as though he's in the cave now. He's forgotten about philosophy. And that he needs to, he needs to turn towards the light as representing kind of a kind of enlightenment as representing philosophy, um, as representing the truth and rationality and all these kinds of things. Uh, so that's very platonic there. Um, and even when he says, my thoughts recollected, Plato often argued um, that um, the acquisition of knowledge was actually just recollecting stuff that you kind of already knew deep down inside from um, previous lives that you lived. You remember that I mentioned Plato was influenced by Pythagoras who believed in reincarnation and Plato did as well. Uh, so we kind of believe that we all had this sort of innate knowledge um, and that, um, we could, we could um, it could become deeply buried deep down inside of us, but that, that um, a good teacher could bring it out of us. Um, the kind of teacher that Socrates was in Plato's um, view. Um, so that, that acquiring knowledge was really just recollection. So he says, my thoughts recollected. It's like, oh yeah, I, I remember philosophy and, and what it represented to me. And, um, and uh, yes, I have, I've gone off the, 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 the right path here. <laughs> And allowing myself to be overwrought and overcome by emotion and then these muses of poetry, you know, et cetera. Um, there are places often when he, he talks about lady philosophy um, and metaphorically as a kind of ladder. And uh, just like there was a ladder in the kind of dialectic Plato talked about, whereas um, intellectually uh, in following the path of philosophy, it was like you were climbing a ladder of, of different absolute truths and that uh, the higher you climb, the more important were the truths that exist at the top of the ladder, like the form of the good, et cetera. Um, and so there's references there. Um, there's also discussion of happiness and what happiness consists in. That's very considered uh, simp uh, representative, similar to what we saw in reading Aristotle's The Comache and Ethics. When he says the ultimate goal of human life is happiness, and what does happiness consist in? It's not this frivolous kind of bodily pleasure. It's a deeper and more intellectual, richer kind of happiness. I even talked about the idea of human flourishing um, or human well-being as maybe a better definition for the Greek word eudaimonia that's often translated as happiness um, and as it is in our, our text as well. Um, so there, there's clear evidence of, of Aristotle in here too. It is interesting that they're not more direct ref uh, references to Christianity. You can see it there. You can see its influence in, um, in various ways and, and the spiritual life of Boethius. But um, there are people that have sort of been um, surprised, maybe a little confused by the fact that um, you don't see more direct references to um, in particular um, the God of the New Testament and to um, Christianity and the consolation. So that's a kind of a longstanding mystery um, about the text. Um, I believe those are all the things that I wanted to talk about with you. Um, 
And again, hopefully that provides some helpful background. Um, I know you have some discussion questions coming due here um, later in the week. I'll be doing another lecture and I'll address um, some of the things that are a part of those discussion questions. Um, one of the things that really becomes a focal point of the book later on is this question about whether or not God's foreknowledge of all events, all worldly events, um, means that human beings don't have free will. And Boethius um, is, is kind of thinking about this, and it's important, right? If, if, if he's being punished here um, for certain um, things that he did, um, did he live his life with free will? Was his, the path that he followed not a path that was actually his chosen path, but was a path that he was inevitably forced down because God has foreknowledge of all things? Does that mean everything is predetermined? And if so, is it really just? Is it really fair for him to, um, to, to be in the situation that he's in if uh, he had no choice, if the things that happened to him were all predestined? So that question of free will becomes really important and theologically becomes very important as well. And so Boethius will present an argument for free will that's kind of complicated. I'll talk about it in my next lecture, um, but you'll be reading about it and, and, um, um, and hopefully you know, be able to get some of the, the basics of, of this argument. It was an argument that would be adopted by the church and many church figures. So it, it's, it's really important uh, to kind of understand this and see what the basis of this argument is. It's, it's, it's really ingenious uh, argument for the existence of free will. Lots of different people have made arguments for the existence of free will, just as people have made arguments for why free will doesn't exist. Um, either, either theological arguments or arguments based on, uh, on um, ideas uh, a little more closely tied to science, um, loosely speaking. And we'll talk some about some of those in the future as well. But you will have that in, in some of the reading you'll be doing over the course of the week. And so I just wanted to mention that is a, is a major theme and something I'll be returning to in my um, in my next lecture. So again, I'm hoping you found that helpful. Um, as always, if you have questions, please let me know, send me emails. Um, if you want to Zoom and talk about something, I'm perfectly happy to do that. Um, again, just let me know. And I hope you have a good um, rest of your week.